genetics. And what we, of course, know here is that we have variations. There's not only the, the genes that you inherit from your father and mother, but each individual has random variations called SNPs. These are single nucleotide polymorphisms. And what happens is that every time one of your cells divides, you're basically copying millions and millions of base pairs and sometimes it simply gets it wrong. And it can make a small change in a part of your genome, just one nucleotide change. And if that persists and reaches above a certain threshold, then it becomes what we call a single nucleotide polymorphism. So it's just basically when the DNA copying machinery makes a mistake. Think about all the cells in the deep layers of our skin dividing. Each time a cell divides, three billion bases have to be copied. And, and that's where we get our individual differences. And you can go on to the web and look at genome browsers and find how different uh, SNPs or SNPs can result in different responses to, uh, to drugs. And for example, if it's in a P450 enzyme, then you're going to have a, a different possibly a different speed at which you will be metabolizing the drugs. For example, you can have variations in one of the P450 enzymes. These are the enzymes in the liver which metabolize toxins. One of these is the CYP2D6. And some people are ultra metabolizers and sometimes some people are poor metabolizers. And that varies between people of different racial origins. So 30% of Saudis and Ethiopians are ultra metabolizers in CYP2D6. And that because they metabolize nortriptyline, then treating with, them with nortriptyline is less effective. Conversely, about 10% of Caucasians have our are poor metabolizers in uh, they have poor metabolizer versions of CYP2D6 and that reduces the rate of tamoxifen metabolism so they, they, they effectively you need to cut the dose down with them and similar examples here with uh, different uh, CYP variants. There's a variation in our genetics, which has quite major consequences, actually. And this one example of that is plasma cholinesterase deficiency. So why is that important? Well, it's, think of muscle. You all know that if you add, if you look at muscle fibers, a muscle fiber like this, you have acetylcholine receptors. And of course, acetylcholine receptors are sensitive to acetylcholine. So this is acetylcholine, which of course binds to the acetylcholine receptor and that produces a response. In surgery, you sometimes want, when a person is fully anaesthetized and unconscious, of course, you want to block transmission at the neuromuscular junction so they don't start twitching. 
And one way you do that is to add this drug, which is called succimethonium. What succimethonium does, that also binds to the receptor, but you don't get a response. because it binds, opens the channel, then blocks it. So you end up not getting a response here. So it's a way of paralyzing somebody during surgery. Now, of course, succimethonium itself, well, of course, we're supposed to know this, is broken down by cholinesterase. So that means that this succimethonium is kept under control, if you like. So there's a balance. The problem is, I think you've guessed it, some people have low levels. And this can be quite, quite fatal, actually. It's one in about 1 in 3,000 people. And of course, what it means is you end up with not so much cholinesterase, and so you end up with lots of succimethonium, eff effectively. And that, of course, is, is quite serious. So that's an, one example. There's, a, there's another example, which is called acute intermittent porphyri porphyria. Acute... And what happens here is we have a compound, a bunch of compounds inside us called porphyrins. They're not usually that toxic, but they are broken down into heme by an enzyme called porphobilogen. Porphobilinogen. Deaminase, which I think is probably easy just to refer to it as PGBD. Um, problem is, I think you guessed where this is going. Some of us have not very much of this, which is not a problem. Well, that does mean that porphyrins increase, but most of it, it doesn't affect us until the precursor, which makes the porphyrins, is then activated by drugs, which can happen quite a lot, and then you get all sorts of symptoms. So individuals then can differ in ways which are just affect their responses to drugs, but also can result in in diseases and disorders which are quite dangerous. And so that brings up the possibility of personalised medicine. Let me give you an example. Of why that might be important. If you take a lot of people. And you give them a drug such as a salicylate compound, such as um, aspirin or something like that, and you measure the concentration after a few hours and you plot a histogram, what you find is you get kind of like one population of people like that, a bell curve. So that's after two hours. If you do the same thing another six hours later, what you find is not one, but two peaks. So these have metabolized it much more effectively. So the question is, which group does your particular patient belong to? Remember, we said that genes and SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, cause this difference in response. So if we knew 
what these were, perhaps we could predict the effects of drugs. Why is that important? A lot of the times it isn't. But with drugs like warfarin, where if it's too high, so if it's too low, no effect, and the patient bleeds, or whatever. Um, if it's too high, well, it can actually actually kill you. So the idea with personalised medicine is to find out someone's genes and their SNPs, but of course you don't sequence the whole thing. You use biomarkers, which you measure in the blood, and it gives you some sort of index as to the genotype of the individual, and you use that to predict how they're going to affect to a drug, how they're going to affect, how they're going to be affected by a drug. The problems are. One is that the results of these tests is complicated. And secondly, it's expensive and is very rarely cost effective. So it has promise, but there are big hurdles to overcome.